Hey, it's Nate from the Ask a Christian podcast, and I wanted to talk a few minutes today about the 10 Atheist Non-Commandments. So this is nothing new. In 2014, there was a contest, and all the participants from around the world, well, it was like 18 countries, 27 United States states represented, but there were thousands, like 28,000 submissions on who could one-up the Christian Bible because I guess they thought the Ten Commandments there were just so bad. So winners were chosen about the best 10 non-commandments. And uh, anyway, what reminded me about this was I, I was on Facebook and someone shared a meme. I couldn't find the exact meme, but it reminded me. And I thought, well, let's go over and let's see, you know, how, how good all the participants of humanity did in one-upping the Bible. So let's just take a look at this. Even though I couldn't find the original meme, I found, you know, the same thing on CNN, which is just as good or bad. You know, give the devil their due. Probably, literally. Shout out. Anyway, let's get to it. We'll talk a little bit more about the beginnings and the founders and, and some of that in a minute. Because that's a whole whole interesting thing, too. Uh, rules for me and not for thee, that type thing. Or rules for thee and not for me, that one. Be open-minded and willing to alter your beliefs with new evidence. You would like to think that's that's an accusation about, you know, Christian, religious, fundamental people. Like, you're so dumb. You believe in sky fairy tales because blah, blah, blah. And you have blind faith because a book tells you to believe it. So aside from that burning straw man, um, how do we do, secular humanist, about, you know, hey, COVID's going to be my go-to for probably the rest of my life. Because that's the most glaring example of lie upon lie. Like, their house of lies has been built. And now it's all out in the open years later. We see how people falsified data, they corrupted evidence, they signed, they said whatever people paid them to say so they could get book deals, they could get prominent positions on TV, and now everyone that's like, trust the science, and the one guy that declared himself the science, everyone sees what an absolute farce that was and how many nefarious things there, there were going into that, and it was the least thing from evidence-based um, that we've all gone through, so... Shout out to you, secular humanists, who continue to get booster after booster, nice knowing you, um, in light of all this evidence. So I would like to pose you take your own first commandment for those of you who are not religious and still unwilling to alter your beliefs in light of uh, incredible evidence that is now verified and available. So let's try commandment, non-commandment number two. Strive to understand what is most likely to be true, not to believe what you wish to be true. Whoa. So usually the common trope against Christians are you're, you have to believe in your God because you're so scared of dying and you're scared of the dark. Maybe there's someone that's like, yeah, I'm scared of dying. I really hope God is true because I'm scared. So sure, I'm sure there's people out there like that. Just like I'm sure that there are atheists out there like that. Not speaking for all of atheism, but you know, can never say never, there's some out there that really wish atheism is true, that when they just die, simple lights out, you cease to exist. Because they don't want to deal with, you know, eternal uh, eternity or continuing to exist, especially in a less than favorable place for all the crap they've done uh, in their lives that they don't want to take ownership and accountability for. That's one of the non-commandments we'll get to in a minute. So this goes both ways. It's not just a slight against, you know, the, the few religious people you can find who, who really wish their beliefs are true because they're scared or something like that. It goes your way too. Have you, have you heard that thing when there's one finger pointing at someone, there's three pointing back? The Jesus way of saying that would be get rid of the log in your own eye before you worry about the speck in the other person's eye. So um, I'll stick with, with that one. Um, Anyway, but yeah, so you can't say there's not atheists that aren't really hoping there's not a God because they don't want to deal with pretty much any version of the God uh, of any religion that would hold them accountable and be like, yes, good job, or no, roast. Um, so no one is immune from that. Number three, the scientific method is the most reliable way of understanding the natural world. Yeah, I mean, I don't think it should be, uh, you know, a Ten Commandment, but it, it's a it's a fact. I don't know any any religious people I know, Christianity or otherwise, that would say otherwise. So the scientific method is the most reliable way of understanding the natural world. But what we're leaving out here is by the time we're talking about the spiritual realm and the metaphysical existence of God, angels, spirits, demons, so the scientific method, admittedly, if science could speak, maybe we should bring that guy in, you know, the science, and have him answer this for the science. But the scientific method specifically is to do with the natural world. 
So if you want to talk about, I don't know, natural claims in the world or something like that and say, well, look, the Earth is not flat because we can fly up and look down and see it's round. Okay, fine. But I'm pretty sure that's not where these people are going with that. Um, they're talking about how if you can't, uh, you know, if you can't measure it, test it, repeat it, have peer-reviewed papers written about it, uh, you know, validating it, which, by the way, back on commandment, non-commandment number one, there are lots of peer-reviewed papers backing up false science and false data. So no one is immune. So that may not be a great non-commandment either. But, yeah, empirical evidence is great. As much as we can trust our senses, which is how we live our lives as best we can. We have empirical evidence for very little, though, compared to how much stuff we don't. Historical, archaeological literary, all these other things that we can't test, we can't repeat, we can't verify, yet we live our lives as though they're true. So empirical evidence is great for explaining the natural world. Whenever it comes to the spiritual world, a lot of times non-religious people will start saying stuff that science would not say. So where science would assign a likelihood or probability, and it would say, well, based on the evidence we've gathered, this is likely, or the probability is high, or the probability is unlikely or low where a lot of other people say, if you don't have empirical evidence um, and follow the scientific method, it doesn't exist. Um, your God can't be real. The spiritual world can't be real uh, because they don't have empirical evidence. So, but they're saying something that science would not say. They're like the other guy that declared himself science. I'm talking about Dr. Fauci. If no one knows that, I'm talking about Fauci. When he went on national TV and declared himself the science, he says he speaks for all science. No one can question him or they're questioning the science. That's why I say that if anyone hadn't figured that out by now. Anyway, but lots of people find themselves in his shoes because they're saying what science wouldn't say. They'd say, based on the evidence I have, uh, the probability is, is low, or it would say, I can't speak to that. I need data. I need natural things to test. And the whole claim of spirituality or metaphysical stuff is, by nature, it's not natural. It's not dust. It's not chemicals. It's, it's this spiritual world. It's a different category shift. So I spent too much time on that. The point is, it's moot. It doesn't matter. Science is more on the side of Christianity than not in this one because science would just say, that's out of my pay grade. I can't speak to that. I only deal with dust and atoms and evidence and stuff we can see in a lab and microscope and test and repeat. Um, so when we're talking about this, science would be like, can't speak to that, bro. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. Bring me data. Um, while a lot of other people who like to cozy up to science are saying stuff science never would say. All right, number four. Every person has the right to control their body. You could find some examples where even the people who wrote this non-commandment would probably say that's not the case, um, but they would be kind of few and far between examples, right? Like maybe someone who was not in control of their faculties, they ran around trying to do self-harm, um, and if their, their self-harm, um, you know, came, came into contact with other people and harmed other people, even though it's their body and they're controlling it, um, we have secular laws in place and it's not religiously based. It's like, Hey, if people are out of their mind and they're not in control of their body, yet they are controlling their body, we will put them under a psych psychiatric evaluation. We will do different things. Anyways, clearly the point where they're going in here is abortion. Like that, that's, you know, saying it without saying it, glaringly so, though. And generally, I would agree everyone has a right to control, except, you know, the one-off or very rare examples we talked about where it could it could harm themselves, and we don't want that. We want to get them help, so it may take us controlling them a little bit to get them evaluated by a medical professional, get them on medicine. So anyway, without those exceptions, when we talk about abortion, they maybe want to say it's a parasite or a, a baby zygote and it's not a real person. Well, forget all that. The pushback is we are saying it is not you controlling your own body. It is you controlling your own body and the body growing inside of you. So that's where we talk about, is it really a person? Is it really not? Is it a parasite? Is it an alien invader? If we found like one single celled organism, like on Mars, the headlines would say life has been found. Life has been found. But when we have like a fully formed human inside of someone, then, oh, it's an alien invader, or it's a zygote that's not really a human. The point is, leave the thing alone. Almost, uh, almost, uh, ever, without some exceptions, miscarriages, complications, things like that, if you just leave the cute little baby zygote alone, it's going to grow into a human that screams and cries just like you did. Um, anyway, so yeah, if there's a woman and they want to control themselves, 
as a crazy fundamental religious uh, zealot, I guess, I don't think so, but that's the type of people they're talking to, and that's the type of people who increasingly they're categorizing traditionally orthodox positions like my own as. So, um, I think it's suicide would be a sin, so if someone wants to kill themselves, I think that's a sin, and I think, you know, maybe, maybe we should try to get them help and we should get talked to, but ultimately, it's out of our control. If someone's determined to take their own life, ultimately, that's their choice. I believe it's wrong. I believe it's a sin. I believe they're going to be held accountable to God for that, but... Um, if it, I don't think we should physically, um, you know, restrain or imprison people who try to do that, which by the way, lots of places, suicide is illegal. So I don't know how many people are prosecuted for that, but it's, it's a law. And I, I don't know if uh, it's, you don't hear a lot of Christians talking about that law. So I bet there was a lot of secular people that came on board too and thought, Hey, well, you know, maybe they shouldn't kill themselves. However, my position is ultimately, if someone wants to control their body and throw themselves off a bridge. We should do everything reasonable to talk them out of it. But if they're going to do it, they're going to do it. But when we're talking about abortion, it's not just their body they're controlling. It's the life of another person. So that's where it is. Not saying people shouldn't have autonomy over their own body, but it's should you have control over other people's body? No, you should not. So strike number four. Number five, God is not necessary to be a good person, or to live a meaningful life. This may be the thing I agree most on, with a big caveat. One, perhaps the reason someone could even think that, say that, enter a contest, and have this trash be entered as number five non-commandment, is because God exists. So God doesn't need someone to acknowledge him to exist. So put your Christian paradigm hat on with me for a minute. If the Christian God of the Bible is true, and he sustains and creates everything in existence, every molecule, everything, if he didn't do that, you wouldn't exist. So you wouldn't be able to be a good person with a meaningful life because if God wasn't in control of this, you would not exist to do that. Um, that that's a little more from the spiritual side. However, taking taking the idea of God and religion away from it for a minute, true, I agree. God is not necessary. Your acknowledgement of God is not necessary for you to live a good moral life by secular human standards. You can pay your taxes, you can be a good person, you can feed your family, you can work really hard to save up a college fund. You can do all these good moral things by, by secular standards without the belief or acknowledgement of a God. There's no problem there. In Christianity, though, morality comes second. It's not about making a bad person good, it's about making a spiritually dead person alive. That's the point, and I don't know why people keep missing that point. Yes, there is a moral component. If you're a terrible, amoral, immoral person and you find Jesus, be a good person. Stop, you know, doing terrible things. There is a morality component to it. It's all about the life of Jesus. Learn what he does and, and follow his example. But that's not the pinnacle. The pinnacle is eternal life and being spiritually awake, spiritually alive. So um, I would say that. So to recap, first of all, you don't need to acknowledge a God um, in order to do good moral stuff. However... I posit it's only because a God exists and you're creating the image of God that you have the capacity to do anything good or moral at all, whether you believe it or not, whether you acknowledge it or not. Um, and then the next point is, sure, you can do good, decent stuff as a secular humanist or a, you know, militant anti-theist. You can still do what the world considers good moral stuff. The point is, it doesn't matter, and Christianity is not primarily about morality, it's about death versus life. So you completely missed that entire category. Um, I said I agreed more with that than anything else, right? All right, number six, be mindful of the consequences of all of your actions and recognize that you must take responsibility for them. No one is saying otherwise. In Christianity, you do the crime, you do the time. No one is immune. Anyone in society, anyone under a government who breaks that government's laws, the police are going to hold them accountable and they're going to help them, you know, uh, get justice through the restitution, um, whatever the case may be, paying fines, imprisonment. So there's no getting away from, from your uh, crimes, from consequences that your actions have. We're just all alike in that regard. Everyone's in the same giant fishbowl. So clearly... This is, a, this is a smite or a slight against Christians who believe you can be forgiven of all these wrong things you've done. For the atheist who doesn't believe in the spiritual world anyways, your talking point ends right there. We agree, as far as you're concerned, 
the secular natural world is all you think we have, no one's immune. If I'm like, I rob a bank and I'm like, oh, God forgave me. I don't have to go to prison now. You're going to prison. So that point is, how are these the winners? How are these the best these contestants came up with? Anyway, so be mindful as a Christian who believes that you could be forgiven spiritually of every bad thing you've ever done by placing your faith in Jesus alone to save you. Ask Jesus, the God of the Bible, save me, forgive me, I repent. Stop doing what you know you shouldn't do. You rob banks, stop it. Repent of that, go the other way. Work hard, do good, give to those in need. Um, give me eternal life. Make me born again. That's what Jesus says. And at that moment, you're forgiven of all the bad stuff in the eyes of God. You're clean. You're a new person. Uh, in the eyes of the world, you're still going to have to answer for your crimes. You're still going to have consequences for whatever actions you did, just like all the atheists. So that's another number six is not worth being number six. Um, maybe they should have Christians judge this. Anyway, number seven, treat others as you would want them to treat. <laughs> uh they recognize the golden rule, while not exclusive to the Bible. They recognize it's a good idea to have, and they, they know it should be in there, but they just can't give the Bible or anyone else credit for it. So they take the golden rule, twist it, convolute it, and regurgitate it to say exactly the same thing, just with a lot more word salad. <laughs> good Lord. Number seven, treat others as you would want them to treat you and can reasonably expect them to want to be treated. Think about their perspective. I have a perspective to think about. Golden rule versus platinum rule. The golden rule that stood the test of time for millennia. Not a millennium, millennia. Multi-thousands of years. So, the golden rule, treat others how you want to be treated. Then, someone got the idea of, well, let's, I don't know, one-up Jesus. Let's one-up, you know, the other people that espouse the golden rule and have lived by it successfully for thousands of years. Um, and it's the platinum rule. And it's like, oh, don't worry about treating others how you want to be treated. Treat others how they want to be treated. That is a recipe for a spoiled brat, if people can't see that. I think the golden rule, like if you just give people what they want, I want to be worshipped as a king. <laughs> I want you to give me, empty out your savings and give me all your money. That's how I want you to treat me. You see how, where that goes? And that's like one of the more subdued explanations of that. So imagine, if you truly follow that and treat people how they want to be treated, you're going to live in a world that you don't want to live in. And it, by the way, it's going to negate all these other commandments because you're going to see the worst side of people if you give them what they want all the time. And no one is going to espouse these 10 non-atheist commandments. Um, anyway, so you're making a bunch of adult children babies if you give treat everyone just how they want to be treated. The golden rule is a call for temperance and humility. So while I would like to, you know, <laughs> don't take me that serious. If people start bowing down to me and worshiping me as a king, um, I'd feel awkward. I'm like, okay, don't, no, I, I was kidding. I was kidding. But if they tr treated me how I would want everyone to treat me, like, uh, you know, they would be my servants. They would maybe fan me with leaves or grapes. See, I can't even come up with, like, a subdued example. That's just where I'm going. I'm thinking very kingly, very monarchly. Um, but it's a call to temperance. So if that's how I want people to treat me and people treat me that way, but then I'm supposed to reciprocate, well, I don't want to do that. So it makes me think with a little bit of humility about myself. I'm like, okay, even though in a perfect world where I was the ruler, I would want people to spoil me. I would want people to treat me this way, but I don't necessarily want to do that to other people. I don't want to bow down to other people. I don't want to feed other people grapes and fan them with leaves. So... Um, it calls me to temper my own expectations. So as a result, instead of thinking, oh, this is how I want to be treated, it's like, okay, well, let's scale that down. So I just want to be treated, you know, generally, how everyone would agree to with, with respect, with dignity. Uh, you know, I'd like people to be cordial with me. I'd like to be uh, that. And it tempers it. So then when I, I think about reciprocity and I think, okay, well, how will I treat other people? Okay, I'll, I'll be helpful, I'll be respectful, I'll treat them with kindness, with dignity. Uh, if they need some help, I'll give them some help. Things like that. And now, instead of us being a bunch of Egyptian pharaohs, um, feeding each other grapes and all this other stuff, now we have, we're temperate. Uh, we're toned down a little bit more. So it's like, oh, okay, I don't want to go extreme with this, so I'll just be cool to you, you be cool with me. Okay? And that's worked just fine. And I think it will keep working just fine. And uh, I, I don't know, I'd be curious if anyone's tried the platinum rule or has examples of that. Anecdotal's fine. I, I would like to know. Like, th uh, that's just such a recipe for giant spoiled babies. Um, imagine a world full of them. So, 
I was going to say something else about that. What was I going to say? Help me remember. Mm, you want to be treated? Maybe I'll come back to it. Anyways, number eight. We have a responsibility to consider others, including future generations. You know what? This goes into a... I think I'll do this on my podcast tomorrow. Hang on, I have it here. Why is it that when people when people talk another slight everything's a slight like you know if people would poke their finger at at religions half as much uh as they do at christianity do that but why don't they is it because inherently it's a it's a christian cult culture these people are warring against or maybe christianity is true and that's why they feel the need somewhere deep down in them that they'll never know um but that somewhere there's this this response to fight reaction to fight the truth and they don't spend a whole lot of time on other religions because somehow on a spiritual level that they will deny exist, they, they just don't waste their time with it because it's it's false. I don't know. It's one thing to consider. Um, whenever people talk about this and they say, um, consider others including future generations, the slide against Christians is you think you have a sky world that you're going to and you can just let this earth burn. So why do you care? Why do you care about being a good steward of this earth? Well, for one, we do believe that. Um, we do believe there's an eternal existence, there's a heaven um, there's a place where God lives where we'll be forever with our Lord. Our Bible tells us that. We believe that. Not just because a good book promises it's really, really true, and that's why you should believe it. There's more to it than that. But the Bible in Genesis also, God tells Adam, he's like, look, here, here's your earth, here's your world. I'm giving this to you. Be a good steward. We have a responsibility. We have a mandate. So on top of it's just the right thing to do, which should be everyone's base, God tells us, yes, we do have another world to look forward to, a continued existence. But also, if someone's like, well, hey, let's just start fires. Let's burn this planet down. Well, hey, God also says take care of it and be a good steward. Um, but the, the real thing is because it's the right thing to do. We have kids. Even if we think when we die, we go to, to heaven, um, we still have kids. We still have other generations coming, just like all the secular humans do. So no one wants to be a monster and be like, well, I'm about to die. So, you know, I don't care about you, uh, little Timmy. Um you know, good luck growing up in this world. I, I did as much as I could to, like, poison it because I don't care about it. So that's that's kind of how people think the slide is on Christians. But then why is it the religious people end up doing a better job in most cases of, like, fighting evil and standing up for causes they believe in that are generally good for the planet Earth? So even, you know, environmentally speaking, technology, um, even when it, people are innovative and come up with the best ways to, you know, trap poison, trap pollutants, all this other stuff, it's a lot of religious people who are included in those projects or outright invent them. Um, so why is that? Even though we think we have a continued existence to go to, is it some something in us that just wants us to strive to do better things and be better people because it's just that's that's how we're built. That's how we follow this God. That's what Jesus did. He left the world a better place. Uh, he healed people. He fed people. He did all these good humanitarian efforts. And, you know, the guy walked and rode a donkey. <laughs> ah, now you can see the secular humanist kitty. Ah, you'd burn the world, wouldn't you? You'd burn the world. You'd burn the world. Okay, okay, maybe you're just going to bite me and drink my blood. Anyways, so that's the point, right? So that's what I would say. Christians somehow, and religious people, even other religious people may not believe in the same God, but they have this intrinsic sense of like morality about them, where even though secular humanist people say how they don't need a God to be good and do good moral stuff, then why is that? Maybe because it's just much, much less of them, and most of the planet is a theist of some kind, um, so they're a small number, but... Um, Kitty cat, if you pee in here, it will be bad. Even though I will treat it with love and respect. Make it sleep outside. Um, that's what I would say. This thing's not going to leave me alone. Are you guys distracted? I'm distracted. You chasing a mouse? Um... Yeah, so consider that next time. Before you start talking about how Christians don't care about anything and we just want to let the world burn and trash everything, it usually seems to be the other way around. The people that don't have a, a morality pool or, you know, espouse we can be good and moral without God, a lot of times they aren't. And you can tell just by talking and listening to them. So there are plenty of atheists who I know and respect as, as a person, as e even a friend, and I believe they generally care about this earth, about this planet, about their family, and they do a good job. So just listen to the people. But it's not like they have a, a step up or a one-up club that non-religious people intrinsically are better at this because oftentimes they are not. 
and it's Christians or other religious people who have the conviction about them to stand up against evil, to stand up for people's rights. Um, and, and then when we talk about, you know, going back to the other commandment, number four, the ten, the four non-commandment about controlling their body, it's religious people that want to stand up to keep operations from being forced on people who don't have the capacity, say a child, from transitioning into another gender or another sex or whatever. So it's a lot of religious people that will take up this fight for where they see as evil or something being indoctrinated or something being forced on them for nefarious means. So people would want you to say, well, this person, you know, they're a seven-year-old boy, and but they really know they're a girl. When the seven-year-old boy, like on the podcast we recently talked about in Texas, his mom stole him and took him away to California where it's a trans-sanctuary state now. Um, and the Christian people are like, and other people, there are some secular humanist people too, that saw that as wrong. Not just about the kid. If the kid's like, hey, I'm this and I want to be that or I need to have a surgery to affirm my, my identity or something like that. But people saw through it and saw that it's a lot of times corrupt layers deep. So forget the kid and what they actually think they are or are not. Before we even get to that, let's look at all the corruption and nefarious things that could be going on underneath the radar. Like... Um, you know, for example, the mom wants to wants to be able to say, hey, I have a trans son or I have a trans daughter in their social club. And they're like completely narcissist and void of any actual empathy for their child. They just want to be in the cool mom trans club or whatever, which it, it seems like this person was. If you're familiar with the case I'm talking about it was like six months or a year ago. And then you have like the judges, the courts, all these other people are like this incestuous relationship with each other, the, the government, the state, the courts, the municipalities, and, it's, and the doctors. And it just seems like, you know, if you, if you do this stuff, you're going to have a patient in millions of dollars over a lifetime versus if you do therapy, if you do counseling, if you like at least wait until they're old enough to have competent brain function and their brain's fully developed enough to say, yes, I can consent. I fully understand the ramifications of this. I want to do that. Even instead of doing something like that, you can just see before we talk about any religious or spiritual issue, how many pitfalls there are and how many nefarious means there could be. So the whole point of that was people who are religious of some bent still do a better job of standing up for the innocent and the people who can't stand up for themselves. So number nine. There is no one right way to live. Okay, maybe I agree with that more than non-commandment number five. As a Christian, I believe there is one right way to live, and that is spiritually based. That's within us. That's, that's you know, what Christians espouse is the life of Christ. And so I, I guess I don't have a lot to say about non-commandment number nine, except we just fundamentally disagree. So from the Christian standpoint and other religions, they believe their right way is the way to live if we're talking about a God. So I'd say we fundamentally disagree. I believe there is a right way to live. If we're talking about a religion or an afterlife, it is Jesus. Live like him. Do what he says. That is the way to live. But since they're coming at this from a secular approach, if they're not talking about because people believe in a God or something like that, well, okay, they would say, sure, there's not one right way to live um, if we're talking about secularly, but I guarantee there's gonna. they would say there are some wrong ways to live. So... We have laws, we have jails full of people whose secular society has decided is a wrong way to live. So let's uh, let's be fair again. If from a spiritual aspect, yes, there is one God, there is one way to heaven, there is one way to be to have this afterlife with your Creator. From Christianity, that's Jesus, that's the Bible. Follow the God of the Bible. Um, if we're not talking about God, and we're just talking about secular life. Yes. Um, there, there are two, there's multiple okay ways to live. Um, someone, someone may like ketchup over mustard on a hot dog. I think it's heresy, but you know, you get what I'm saying, right? So there's lots of, of avenues you can live your life and be fine in secular society. Um, but there are plenty of wrong ways that say, no, no, no. So like how a Christian says, no, 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 you can't be that religion or, you know, you're not going to inherit heaven. You're not going to have afterlife. Like, hey, you can't have no religion. You're going to, you have to believe in a God. You have to believe in this God. Otherwise it's going to go bad for you. And we don't want that. We want the best for you. They would also say the same thing. They would say, you can't go around murdering people. Sorry, there's a better way. And if you go around murdering people and eating people's brains, um, then you have to go to prison because that's a wrong way to live. So no one's immune from that one. Number 10. Leave the world a better place than you found it. Sure. Just sure. You know what? That I changed my mind. That's the one I agree with more. I agree with that. 
Leave the world a better place than you found it. The Bible says that. God says that. It's inherent within us. Our DNA says that. Like if we have kids, we have offspring. We see kids around us. They're growing up for the next generation. Why would anyone, religious or not, want to leave the world better than we found it? There are people that just want to see the world burn. So there are people like that for whatever not-so reason they have. Um, or they just don't care. They have no empathy. They, they don't care. They just want to get theirs and let everything else fall. But, yeah, generally, leave the world a better place than you found it. And I think that's a callback slight to the other one where they think Christians are just like, I don't need to leave the world better than I found it. I can leave it worse than I found it. I may actively try to leave it worse than I found it because I have somewhere better to go to. But that's simply wrong. That's not in compliance with any of our scripture, with our Bible, with our beliefs. And it's just secularly or religiously leave the world a better place uh, than you found it. Okay, so I want to go back a little bit about the founder of this because I thought maybe they should take some of their own advice or just repent, fall on your face before Jesus, ask forgiveness, ask for eternal life, and receive it and solve the mystery of the universe. But if they're unwilling to do that, let's look at the founder. Where is it? All right. Lex Bayer, an executive, Airbnb. As soon as I saw that, I just thought, ha, that's fun. And this other guy, John. So they came up with this. They had a part in it. And I thought, well, you know, let's just see how Airbnb, because I, I couldn't remember. I've never used it. I don't care to use it. Um, I don't travel much. I don't do a lot of traveling. But I remember when it first came out, it was it was lauded as this really great experience, and it was cheaper and all this other stuff than hotels, and it was more private and intimate and, like, family style. But then I, I kept hearing all these controversies. So, you know, I used I used Google's AI, Bard, uh, PCB upon it, and Google, you know, has what, what are some of the controversies in Airbnb? Because I, I couldn't remember, but at a glance, here's my source. So let's just go through some of these. Um, has been involved in a number of controversies surrounding its policies and practices. Some of the most notable include impact on housing prices and availability. Airbnb has been accused of driving up housing prices in, in the market, making it more difficult for people to afford uh, housing, especially tourist destinations. So does that mean um, a 10% increase in rents? Does that sound like, where was it? Oh, was it commandment number seven? Does that sound like they're treating people how they want to be treated? I mean, if you're pricing poor working class people um, out, of, out of housing and raising their rents and all that stuff, that sounds bad. I mean, maybe they should take their own commandments. Or is that just rules for thee and not for me? Like a ruling political elite, by the way. Um, illegal subletting, I understand, to be fair. They can't control everything that their their subscribers do. So to be fair to Airbnb, you know, some of this involves involves people who are, are renting out their homes on Airbnb. They can't be responsible for bad people doing bad things under their name. I mean, they, they can penalize them. They can cancel their account. But reasonably, a lot of the complaints, just like the sexual assaults from the people renting them out and things like that, you can't directly hold Airbnb responsible for things that people do renting out their homes, but it's still under their name. I mean, I don't know if they background check these people or anything, but there are reasonable steps you can do to treat others how they want to be treated. Probably not getting sexually assaulted. Anyway, uh, <laughs> hidden cameras. I and mean, we'll just go through these. So safety concerns. There you go. Some of the uh, host um, injuries, death, tax evasion. <laughs> um, I mean, there's some things you can do, right? Like every time I, I've signed up for apps before, they, they make me verify my income. They make me give my tax ID number. They make me do all this stuff. Um, I don't know Airbnb's practices because I'm sure not going to rent out my home to anyone, um, at least through Airbnb. But um, do they do the same thing? I don't know. So all things considered, I, I just thought it was interesting that to, to juxtapose Airbnb's controversy surrounding it with the people who had a hand in coming up with these 10 atheist non-commandments because the Bible was so bad at it. Um, I think they are too. So no one is immune. Everyone is in the same sandbox. So, <laughs> this went on longer than I thought. I blame my cat. I, I blame my cat. And I'm not going to treat it the way it wants to be treated because it's definitely. I was making jokes about being a pharaoh and people fanning me with fans and feeding me grapes. My cat, I, I know, it definitely. Oh, look at it over there. Yeah. It, like a sphinx all perched up. It definitely wants that. Anyway, so, that's my thoughts. I've wanted to talk about that for some time. And I just think, you know, all that glitters is not gold, and the grass is not always greener on the other side. So maybe the Ten Commandments in the Bible just aren't that bad. And if you are unwilling or unable to admit or come to terms that there's a spirit world, there's a God that exists and made you, um, maybe, I don't know, ignore the God stuff and don't try to take 
a command or I mean the golden rule is not a commandment, but don't try to take the golden rule and like twist it and finagle it into something that's your own. It's it, leave it as it lies. It's it's good enough. It's fine. You're not going to improve it. You've made it worse. And um, then you know you'll know a true tree by its fruits. And do people walk the walk and talk the talk and and stuff like that. Um, and it looks like maybe they don't. So be careful when someone says they have a better way. And that's not to let Christians or religious people off the hook. Do they practice what they preach? Just listen to people talk for a little bit and hear what they say and then match up what they say with what they do. Until next time, <laughs> see ya.